Ann Wright, professor and associate head for graduate education in the Department of Material Science and Engineering at Penn State University. John earned a, a, a bachelor's uh, in science in glass engineering, uh, in glass engineering science in 2001, a BA in computer science in 2001 as well, and a PhD in glass science in 2006, all from Alfred University. He joined uh, Corning Incorporated in 1999 and served in multiple roles there, including senior research manager of the glass research department. Uh, John is the inventor and co-inventor of several new glass compositions uh, for Corning, including Corning Gorilla Glass products, which are commonly used in cell phones, uh, for example. Uh, John, uh, John also joined the faculty at Penn State in 2017 and is currently a world-recognized expert in fundamental and applies, uh, an applied glass science, statistical mechanics, computational and condensed matter physics, thermodynamics and kinetics, and the topology of disorder uh, networks. John is the author of over 320 peer review publications and is the incoming editor in chief of the Journal of the American Ceramic Society. He is co author of the very well known uh, textbook uh, titled Fundamentals of Inorganic Glasses. And also, he is um, an author of a newly published textbook uh, titled Materials, Kinetics, Transport, and Ray Phenomena. Um, John is a fellow of the National Academy of Inventors uh, with 67 granted US patents and another 20 additional patents pending. And John is, all, uh, is also a fellow of the American Ceramic Society and the Society of Glass Technology. And he's a member of the National Academy of Engineering. So again, it's with, with great pleasure to introduce John to give this presentation. So without further ado, please join, uh, uh, John, the audience is yours. All right, thank you so much, Victor. And, and thanks to both you and Olivia for the kind invitation. Um, so nice to be uh, with you all. Um, so our first presentation tonight is on the topic of glass relaxation called Relaxation is Everywhere. Um, so let's start somewhere pleasant. Um, how about Paris? Uh, this is a photo that uh, my family and I took uh, during a vacation back a couple of years before the pandemic started. These are the, the famous stained glass windows that are at Saint-Chapelle, which is this beautiful chapel built over 900 years ago. Um, pretty close to the Notre Dame Cathedral. And if you go inside this chapel and you look around it, it's like being inside this beautiful work of art with all these, these detailed uh, stained glass images all around you. And I bring this up because, you know, as engineers and as scientists, we tend to think about materials in terms of what they can do in terms of their engineering properties and what applications they can have and so on. But it's also important to, to recognize the, the role that materials play in other aspects of society, including um, artistic and other cultural aspects as well. Uh, but I also bring this up to, to point out that if you look very closely at the individual uh, panes of stained glass here, you might notice that they, at least some of them, appear to be thicker at the bottom compared to the top. And this has led a lot of people around the world to guess that um, the glasses are flowing over time, that over the years and over the centuries at room temperatures, the glass would be slowly flowing uh, downward, making it thicker at the bottom compared to the top. Now, a very good friend of mine, uh, Professor Edgar Zonoto from um, Federal University of Sao Carlos in Brazil, um, originally thought that this was a local urban legend in Brazil. And he was surprised to discover when talking with his colleagues from around the world that it was also a common urgent urban legend in North America and in Europe and, and really uh, all around the world. And so he decided to test this out. And the way he tested it was to um, melt a, a modern glass composition and measure its viscosity curve. And he fitted it with this well-known, well-established equation for the temperature dependence of viscosity known as the vogel vulture tamman equation. And then he took the fitted equation, extrapolated it down to room temperature and determined that yeah, glass would flow, but it would flow on the time scale of about 10 to the 33 years. So many, many orders of magnitude longer than the age of the universe itself. So much too, 
too slow to flow. Um, now, this uh, paper, of course, got a lot of uh, attention, including attention in the um, kind of the, the general public. Uh, there was one particularly astute reader of the paper, another good friend of mine, Professor Prabhat Gupta from Ohio State University. Um, and he noted that that equation, the vogel vulture tamman equation, is really only applicable in the equilibrium case, meaning for the liquid or the supercooled liquid. So the logarithm of the viscosity versus inverse temperature, as you go to lower temperatures in the equilibrium case would follow this vogel vulture tamman equation. But what actually happens is that at viscosities around 10 to the 12 Pascal seconds, there is a gradual freezing in of that liquid structure into the glassy state. And that leads to this departure from the vogel vulture tamman equation to you get this freezing in and this, this straight line scaling this Arrhenia scaling, given that it's a log of a dynamic property versus one over temperature. And this corresponds to the so-called isostructural viscosity or the non-equilibrium viscosity of the glass, which is quite a bit lower than the viscosity of the liquid. So they redid the estimate um, and determined that, yeah, the glass would flow, but this time it was on the order of 10 to the 23 years. So something like 10 orders of magnitude or nine orders of magnitude faster than what uh, Professor Zanotto had originally predicted, but still many orders of magnitude um, larger than the age of the universe. So the, the glass is not actually um, flowing in these stained glass windows. And the overall conclusion was that, that the glass appears thicker at the bottom compared to the top because of the limitations of medieval glass manufacturing. So the, the glasses were, were put at the, the end of a rod and basically spun out in a, a process known as the crown process. And then this disc that was made would have thicker glass in the middle, thinner glass around the circumference uh, that was cut into pieces, put into stained glass windows. And then it's only natural for the stained glass artisan to put the thicker pieces uh, on the bottom because it gives the impression at least of improved mechanical stability. But you know the fact that there was you know, nine or 10 orders of magnitude difference in viscosities, uh, just accounting for the non-equilibrium nature of the glassy state, um, makes it really important for us to understand uh, what is glass and uh, you know, how does it come about and what are the implications of its non-equilibrium character. And for that, we turn to uh, this volume temperature diagram, uh, which comes from our, our textbook here with Dr. Varshneya. And uh, this figure really uh, en encompasses um, how we get a glass in the first place and also demonstrates some of the unique features of the glassy state. So if we start up here uh, at point A in the liquid state, and so this is at high temperature and high volume, if you were to lower the temperature, you'd move from point A to point B. And normally what would happen if you stay in thermodynamic equilibrium is that when you cool just below the melting point in the shaded gray region here labeled C, there would be a first order thermodynamic phase transition, which would um, crystallize the liquid. So the, the liquid upon cooling below the normal melting point of the crystal would then crystallize and then continued cooling of the crystal would follow this line down below. Now that's what happens if we stay in thermodynamic equilibrium. And of course, this first order phase transition involves a discontinuous change in volume and enthalpy and, and entropy. But crystallization takes time because it takes time for the disordered non-crystalline atoms in the liquid to rearrange themselves into a well-ordered crystalline pattern. Um, in some liquids, this occurs very easily. So for example, with water, the water molecules are, are very fluid, um, even below zero degrees Celsius. And so they can very easily crystallize, which means that it's actually difficult to, um, to quench water fast enough to form a glass. On the other hand, a, a liquid such as silica um, is extremely viscous at its liquidus temperature. In other words, it's extremely vi viscous at the temperature below which crystallization is thermodynamically favored. And so as a result, for these, these better glass formers, the ones that exhibit a, a higher viscosity around their liquidus temperature, 
um, they can be cooled fast enough to avoid crystallization and enter this metastable regime known as the supercooled liquid regime. So from a thermodynamic point of view, the supercooled liquid is metastable, meaning that if you leave it unperturbed, it's not going to do anything. But if you perturb it enough, it could find a deeper equilibrium uh, by undergoing a phase transition. So the supercooled liquid is just any liquid that is cooled below its normal freezing point. Now, if you take the supercooled liquid and continue to cool it, the motion of, of the atoms or molecules in the liquid becomes progressively slower, um, becomes exponentially slower actually as the temperature of the system is lowered. And eventually the time scale of the atomic motions in the supercooled liquid becomes slow relative to our observation time scale um, as you know, scientists either working in the lab, observing it or using um, the, the product. And when that happens, we enter this so-called glass transformation range or glass transition range. This is not a thermodynamic phase transition. This is a kinetic transition, which is a gradual freezing in of the supercooled liquid uh, because we are observing it on a time scale, which is faster than the time scale that is required for it to relax back to its metastable equilibrium. And um, so here we've got the supercooled liquid state. We gradually freeze this into the glassy state. And what we get in this glassy state is a, a phase of matter that behaves in many ways like a solid. It behaves you know, mechanically like a solid. It breaks like a, a brittle solid, uh, but it has the structure of a liquid. And it also retains some liquid state properties like um, viscous flow. And so glass is, you know, it inherits um, some of the properties of a solid, some of the properties of a liquid, but it has its own unique features as well, being a non-equilibrium state of matter. So here at this temperature, the equilibrium is the crystal, the metastable equilibrium is the supercooled liquid, and the glass is out of equilibrium compared to the supercooled liquid. It, it is in fact unstable. It's an unstable equilibrium. And in principle is continuously approaching the supercooled liquid state. Or in other words, continuously relaxing towards the supercooled liquid state, trying to lower the Gibbs free energy of the system. Now in practice for most glasses, this process is so slow that we don't observe it um, at room temperature. However, if you wait long enough, or if you take this glass and you heat it back up again uh, towards the glass transition regime, then the dynamics can be accelerated enough so that that relaxation behavior can be uh, observed. And what happens over time is that this glass, let's say if it's heated around here and just held isothermally at this temperature, it will be continuously relaxing towards this supercooled liquid line. So that is one of the, the <clears throat> side effects of glass being a non-equilibrium state of matter and uh, unstable from a thermodynamic point of view is that it's continuously trying to relax towards the supercooled liquid state. Um, another feature um, that that comes directly from its non-equilibrium character is the fact that the properties of a glass depend not just on its chemistry and its pressure and temperature, but also on its entire thermal history. So here, fast cooled glass, one that's cooled faster, undergoes the glass transition at a higher temperature regime because fast cooling means that you're giving the system less time to stay in its metastable supercooled um, liquid equilibrium. And so you end up with properties that are different from the glass that is more slowly cooled, which can stay in equilibrium longer and then undergo the glass uh, transition at a lower temperature. So this is another one of the important consequences of glass being non-equilibrium is that the properties um, depend on its entire thermal history. And you can change the properties of the glass by cooling it fast versus cooling it more slowly. Now, because of this non-equilibrium nature of the glassy state, that means it's not enough to, to use the standard uh, thermodynamic parameters like um, temperature and pressure to define these properties, but we need some other order parameter to help 
um, define the non-equilibrium state of the glass. And the most simplistic way to do that, which is not thermodynamically rigorous by any means, but the most simplistic way to do that is to define what's called the fictive temperature here, labeled as TF. And in this diagram, you can get the fictive temperature by taking the glassy line here, uh, extrapolating it until it intersects with the supercooled liquid line. And then if you drop that down to the temperature axis, this would be the fictive temperature of the slowly cooled glass. If you do the same thing for the fast cooled glass, take the glassy line, extrapolate it until it intersects with the supercooled liquid and drop that down to the temperature axis, then you get the fictive temperature of the fast cooled glass, which is higher than that of the more slowly cooled glass because it underwent the glass transition at a higher temperature. So we can think of the fictive temperature as being um, the temperature at which the, the supercooled liquid is effectively frozen into the glassy state. In reality, the glass transition is this continuous process shown here, uh, but the fictive temperature is an approximation that says we can take this continuous process and approximate it as having, been, having occurred at a single point. Um, so this is something to keep in mind is that we need to keep track of these fictive temperatures as well as the actual temperature of the glass. So relaxation is an inherent property of the glass. Every glass is relaxing. It's relaxing all the time. Um, but the kinetics of that relaxation process vary by orders of magnitude, depending upon the composition of the glass, the thermal history, um, as well as the, um, the temperature. Uh, now, relaxation, in addition to being uh, scientifically very interesting, is also extremely important from an engineering point of view. Um, and one of the, the prime examples of that is the glass that is used for liquid crystal displays. So the way that this works is that um, the glass manufacturers make a glass by relatively fast cooling. So let's say they end up here. And then that glass is sold to companies like Samsung or Sharp, who actually build the display using the glass as a substrate. When that happens, the glass needs to be heated up and then held at an elevated temperature for um, on the order of a couple of hours or so uh, as the thin film electronics are deposited onto the glass substrate, actually building each individual pixel in the display. Now, as the glass is heated up and held at that higher temperature, uh, it, its relaxation kinetics are accelerated. And so this glass um, is actually decreasing its volume. In other words, it's shrinking as it is attempting to approach the supercooled liquid line. And so if you take this initially formed glass, heat it up and hold it at high temperatures, and then cool it back down, you'll end up with a glass that has a slightly lower volume compared to the one that you started with. Or in other words, the glass has shrunk or compacted. And this is the single most important issue for making high performance displays because this shrinkage of the glass can lead to misalignment of the pixels. And as uh, displays increase the resolution, that means the pixel size is becoming smaller and smaller. So it's critically important to be able to um, understand and predict this relaxation behavior of glasses for these display applications, as well as to design glass compositions and design um, thermal uh, process treatments in order to minimize this effect. Um, so uh, good, I spent several years working exactly on this problem at Corning in, um, in our quest to develop improved glasses for, uh, for high performance displays. I also spent a long time working on the same problem for chemically strengthened glasses like Gorilla Glass um, because Gorilla Glass is made through an ion exchange process where the as made glass is immersed in a molten salt bath at temperatures around 400 degrees C. Uh, um, that temperature is, is high enough for relaxation processes to happen, um, including both structural relaxation of the glass as well as stress relaxation. And chemical strengthening works by installing stresses in the glass through the ion exchange process. However, at the same time, those stresses want to relax due to the high temperature. So there's a competition of these, these two effects 
that have to be um, properly accounted for. So relaxation is also critically important for chemically strengthened glasses like Gorilla Glass. Um, another really important um, use of relaxation is in optical fiber. So all of us right now are connected by these very thin uh, strands of glass uh, over which we're communicating optical signals and, and enabling the seminar that we're having uh, across at least two different countries right now. And um, that depends on being able to transmit optical signals over hundreds of kilometers and being able to receive and understand the signal uh, at the other end. The major limiting factor now in optical fiber is in fact Rayleigh scattering. Uh, Rayleigh scattering is caused by um, small scale density fluctuations in the glass. And those density fluctuations can be controlled uh, by controlling the relaxation behavior of the glass. And um, you can in fact dramatically improve uh, optical fiber quality by adjusting the history and the thermal and pressure history of the glasses in order to um, reduce relay scattering. And a final example is ultra low uh, expansion glass, which is used in, uh, or it's used for lithography applications as well as for space applications where um, the glass is, is subject to large variations in um, temperature. And, the, and we can't have um, any types of um, changes to the dimensions of the glass that would lead to distortions. And so ultra low expansion glass is designed to have zero thermal expansion coefficient, and it's designed to be able to adjust um, the thermal expansion curve by adjusting the thermal history of the glass. So when we consider the important aspects of relaxation, um, there's several things that we have to consider. One is the temperature dependence of the relaxation time. And this goes back to the viscosity of the liquid and the supercooled liquid. Another is the thermal history dependence of the relaxation behavior, which goes back to the non-equilibrium viscosity of the glass. Um, then there's the time dependence, which would be the functional form of the relaxation functions. And this goes back to the stretched exponential function. Uh, we also have to consider the type of relaxation because um, different properties may relax in different ways. And then finally, the composition dependence of relaxation. And when we put all of these together, um, we're able to get a more complete picture of the various factors that are affecting relaxation and how we can understand it better and use that knowledge to design better glasses for more advanced applications. So what I'd like to to do today is to just give you a bit of a flavor for these. I'm going to touch on um, the first four of these, I think, um, and just give you a little bit of a flavor. And I'm going to try to, to save um, enough time at the end here so you can ask as many questions as you'd like. Um, now, before I, I jump into this too much, one of the, the most important concepts for the temperature dependence of viscosity is that of the glass transition temperature and fragility. And this was, the, the concept of fragility was initially introduced by Professor uh, Austin Angel from Arizona State University. Um, and in fact, he's originally from Australia. And um, I was just thinking about him in a different context recently because you probably saw the, the sad news about Olivia Newton-John um, who had just passed away yesterday. Uh, she's also originally from Australia. And it turns out that Austin Angel, Professor Angel, was Olivia Newton-John's babysitter um, back a long time ago in Australia. So small world. Um, so beyond that, he is more famous for this definition of fragility and this angel plot, uh, where if you plot the logarithm of viscosity versus um, the Tg over T, this normalized inverse temperature, uh, he made these plots for a wide variety of different glass forming liquids, including oxides like silicon germania, uh, chalcogenides like arsenic sulfide, different modified silicates, ionic liquids, organic liquids. Um, and he put them all on this master plot. And by normalizing in, in this way, Tg over T, um, he found that there's a common point here, which is by definition. So 
Um, there are several different ways to define the glass transition temperature. Angel's definition, which is the one that I tend to prefer, is that the glass transition temperature is the temperature at which the shear viscosity of the supercooled liquid is equal to 10 to the 12 Pascal seconds. And on a log scale, that would be 12 here. And so by definition, if the temperature is normalized by the invert, by the uh, glass transition temperature, by definition then, um, all of these curves pass through a common point at the glass transition temperature, meaning they all have the same viscosity of 10 to the 12 Pascal seconds at this TG, this glass transition temperature. Now, what Austin Angel did was he took these data and he fitted them with the vogel fulcher tamman equation and then extrapolated to this infinite temperature limit. So where Tg over T equals zero, this is the limit of infinite temperature. And what he observed is that all of these curves um, also pass through a common point in the infinite temperature limit. This is just um, an observation based on the fitting of experimental data. So a common point at this end of the plot and a common point at this end of the plot. The next thing that Angel observed was that there were two different types of scaling behavior that he saw. Um, the simple one, which was the Arrhenia scaling here that's uh, observed in silica and germania, um, is what he called a strong liquid. Um, this word strong has nothing to do with mechanical strength. It's not the strength of a solid, but this is the strength of a liquid. So a strong liquid is one in which there are very little um, structural variations as you change the temperature, meaning that there'd be very little variation in the activation barrier for viscous flow as a function of temperature. And if the activation barrier is not changing, then you've got a constant slope here, which gives you this nice um, Arrhenius curve. So silica and germania were both strong liquids exhibiting this type of Arrhenius scaling. Um, everything else exhibited some rather significant departure from Arrhenius scaling. And these non-Arrhenius um, liquids he called fragile, meaning that the structures underwent fairly significant changes as a function of temperature, uh, leading to changes in the activation barrier or effective activation barrier for viscous flow or a changing slope as you change the temperature. And so he classified liquids as either strong or fragile, depending upon if they exhibited an Arrhenius or non Arrhenius scaling of the viscosity. And then he quantified that with this fragility index, which was a lowercase m. And the fragility index is defined as being uh, the slope of this curve, so the slope of the base 10 logarithm of shear viscosity versus Tg over T curve evaluated at the glass transition temperature. So a shallower slope here indicates a strong liquid because if you draw a straight line between these two points, that would give you the shallowest slope, which would be the lowest fragility index, uh, which indicates a strong liquid. However, if you increase the slope here, so you've got a steeper viscosity curve as the liquid is approaching the glass transition, because of the common point here and the common point at the infinite temperature limit, a steeper slope at low temperatures means that it has to uh, undergo a greater um, departure from Arrhenius scaling uh, because it has to shift over to a shallower slope in order to, um, to intersect with this kind here in the infinite temperature limit. So with higher fragility index value, um, have a higher um, non Arrhenius scaling of the viscosity curves. So with that in mind, if we know the glass transition temperature, Tg, and we know the fragility index, and you have a functional form for the viscosity temperature relationship, that can get you the entire viscosity versus temperature curve for the liquid and the supercooled liquid. So historically, that um, temperature dependence of viscosity um, had been modeled using this vogel fulcher tamman equation, which actually dates back to the 1920s. And the appeal of this equation is that it can quite accurately capture 
this viscosity temperature relationship using only three parameters, the, the infinite temperature limit of viscosity, and then two additional parameters here, this A and T0. If you set the T0 equal to zero, you can see that you recover just the, the standard Arrhenius equation um, for a kinetic property. However, um, this equation has some systematic errors, and you can see this immediately if you look in the denominator here, where as the, as the temperature approaches T0, this denominator is going to zero, and if the denominator goes to zero, that means the viscosity is going to infinity, which is not physically realistic. Um, and so this has led to some systematic errors in how well the vulcan fulcher tamman equation can reproduce measured viscosity data, uh, especially at low temperatures. And this has been known for a long time. Um, this is a paper from George Shearer back from 1992, where he's showing uh, systematic deviations between uh, the vocal fulcher tamman equation and the dashed line versus measured viscosity data um, as the points. So many authors have attempted to uh, rectify this problem of dynamic divergence um, by proposing other models. Uh, one of the more successful ones is this Efremov Milchev equation. Uh, this is appealing because it has the same number of parameters as the Vogel Fulcher Tamman equation, this um, infinite temperature viscosity, and then a tau and alpha parameter, so a three parameter model. But the advantage is that it only goes to infinity as the temperature approaches absolute zero, um, which is something that we would expect of any type of kinetic property. Um, however, the, the Evermoth Milchev equation is certainly an improvement, but it also was leading to systematic error in the opposite direction um, we unfortunately found. And so we needed to uh, basically go back to the drawing board and derive our own model for the temperature dependence of viscosity and came up with this so-called Maega equation. This is the original paper here at the bottom. And um, this is the, the functional form of the equation. And again, has just three parameters. It again only goes to infinite viscosity in the limit of absolute zero temperature, um, but the, the shape of the equation falls in between the VFT equation in blue and the Avramov Milchev equation in red. And this new equation here, the Mayak equation is shown in green and is coming in between the two and slightly closer to the Avramov Milchev equation. Um, this is a plot that shows these three viscosity equations all plotted with the same values of the infinite temperature viscosity, the same glass transition temperature, and the same fragility, or in other words, the same slope here. And when you plot them all with the same common set of parameters, then that helps to, under, to uncover some of the intrinsic differences in the shapes among these three curves. Um, so the VFT equation has the greatest amount of curvature because it's trying to get to infinity at a finite temperature. The uh, aframoff milchev equation is the shallowest, and then our Maega equation is coming in between. Now, in order to evaluate how well these do, especially at low temperatures, um, we uh, did some prediction tests where um, we took the viscosity temperature data measured at high temperatures, um, fitted high temperature viscosity data to each of these three models, and then extrapolated down to low temperatures, and then compared to um, measured points at low temperatures where that measured point um, was not used in the fitting of the model itself. And what we can see is that the VFT equation, because of the systematic error at low temperatures, was over predicting um, the low temperature isocom, isocom meaning constant viscosity, over predicting it by about nine and a half degrees, which um, actually is really significant because if you're running like an industrial glass manufacturing process, um, that's the difference between having a well running process and just having. Uh, chaos on the on the floor of the glass plant. Um, the Avramov Milchev equation definitely does better, uh, but you can see that it, there's still systematic error. The isocom temperature. 
Uh, with the Mayanka equation, we were able to uh, eliminate that systematic error and get within about half a degree on average, which is within measurement error of the viscosity. And the reason for the improvement goes back to um, what has been assumed in the various models with respect to configurational entropy of the liquid. Um, one of the most interesting uh, relationships in glass science is the Adam Gibbs relationship. And this is really cool because it connects a kinetic namely the shear viscosity with a thermodynamic property, namely the configurational entropy of the liquid. And um, if we take each of the functional forms that are assumed by the VFT, AM, and Mega equations, and then solve for this uh, configurational entropy as uh, predicted by the Adam Gibbs relation, then you can see um, the different types of scaling behaviors that are considered in these models. So this upper plot here shows Tg over T, meaning the zero here is an infinite temperature. The lower plot flips the x-axis, so it's T over Tg. So now the zero is absolute zero temperature. And what you can see is and at this low temperature end, the VFT equation, because going for infinite viscosity at finite temperature is actually predicting um, zero uh, configurational entropy of the liquid at some finite temperature. And this has led to something that is called the Kausman paradox, although Kausman hated that term. Um, and it's, it's led, unfortunately, a lot of people along the wrong direction with respect to the thermodynamics of the glassy state. Um, but basically, it's it's showing the you know why you shouldn't read too much physics into an equation that does not contain any physics. Um, it's just a, an empirically proposed equation. Um, the the Evermoff Bilchev model and the Mayaka model um, both come in for a smooth landing. They both go to very low configurational entropy at low temperatures, but consistent with the third law of thermodynamics. Uh, of course, the entropy uh, only hits zero in that limit of absolute zero temperature because only in that limit are is the system truly confined, um, unable to explore any other uh, configuration of the liquid. So these two models, the one in red and in green, both give physically realistic ex extrapolations to absolute zero. If you flip the axis um, and look at the high, temperature limit, the, um, the number of configurations in any system is large, but it's always finite. Um, and so we would expect a finite configurational entropy in the high temperature limit. Um, the VFT equation and the MEGA models both give that finite limit, uh, but the evermoff bilchev equation is predicting a divergence of the configurational entropy in the high temperature limit, um, which is not physically realistic. So um, what enables the MICA equation to, to eliminate that systematic error is that it's not just capturing one of these limits accurately, it's not just doing the low temperature limit or the high temperature limit accurately, but doing them both accurately, and then um, we can more accurately reproduce the scaling of the viscosity at all the temperatures in between. So that's the temperature dependence of the viscosity. The next step is the composition, composition dependence. And to do that, we can just take the Mayaga equation and rewrite it into this mathematically equivalent form where it's now written in terms of Angel's three standard parameters from the Angel plot. The infinite temperature limit of viscosity, which we know is a constant independent of composition. The glass transition temperature, Tg, which is a function of the composition x and then the fragility index M, which is also a function of X. And so given that we have a constant infinite temperature viscosity limit, um, the problem of the composition dependence of viscosity comes back to having models for the composition dependence of the glass transition temperature and the fragility. And I'm not gonna get into the details for the sake of time here, but this is built on topological constraint theory, which is considering um, the network of, of um, atoms uh, in the glass in terms of a network of rigid bond constraints, bond stretching constraints and bond angular constraints, and also the corresponding um, rate of configurational entropy loss as the liquid is cooled 
um, through the glass transition temperature, which governs the fragility. And if you put those together, basically you get just two um, free parameters per oxide constituent in the glass. So we've got the rate of configurational entropy loss on the y-axis, the number of rigid topological constraints per atom on the x-axis. Um, so moving from the left to the right favors a higher glass transition temperature. Moving from the bottom to the top favors a higher fragility index. And when you put that all together, this gives you your type of treasure map where you can see what happens as you add different components to the glass. So something like silica favors a high glass transition temperature, but a low fragility. Boron favors a lower glass transition temperature and a lower fragility. Alumina favors a higher glass transition temperature and a higher fragility. These modifier alkaline earth oxides favor a lower glass transition temperature and a higher fragility. So by balancing these um, different components, you can design glasses to give specific viscosity curves. And so putting all of this together, this is a, a model. Uh, it's one uniform unified model um, that accounts for 760 different glass compositions over 7,000 viscosity measurements and using just two parameters per oxide constituent. So a total of, of about 20 parameters in the model. Um, all of these data points, all over 7,000 of them can be um, reproduced across um, the full range of temperatures with uh, very low error. And then using that type of model, we can then design new glasses to have specific viscosity curves. And this is something that we would do routinely um, at Corning is to um, you know, use this type of approach to uh, design the glass compositions to get specific values that we want for um, viscosity. Moving on to the non-equilibrium viscosity of glass. Um, this shows some characteristic scaling behavior of the log viscosity versus inverse temperature, where the liquid with the Maega equation uh, so the liquid or the supercooled liquid here in its metastable equilibrium is shown by the blue curve. But as you cool through the glass transition, so cool around 10 to the 12-ish Pascal seconds, you start to depart from equilibrium. And if you've got a, a higher fictive temperature, that departure occurs at a higher temperature. If you've got a lower fictive temperature, the departure from equilibrium occurs at a, a lower temperature. This gradually turns over as you go, as you cool through the glass transition and the liquid becomes frozen into the glassy state. Um, when you get an Arrhenius scaling here, that is the, the so-called isostructural regime. And what you can see, first of all, is that both glasses here have viscosities that are many orders of magnitude lower than that of the liquid at the same temperature, meaning the glasses are flowing orders of magnitude faster than the corresponding liquids. You will also see that the more slowly cooled glasses, the ones with the lower fictive temperature, have significantly higher viscosity compared to the, the uh, faster cooled glasses. And that is changing by orders of magnitude too. So there's two different parts of this we have to consider. One is the Arrhenius scaling of the viscosity. So it basically, if you fix the fictive temperature and change the temperature, that should give you an Arrhenius scaling of viscosity. And the other is if you draw a vertical line through here, that would be having a constant temperature but changing the fictive temperature. And um, I'm not gonna go through the derivation here, but the final model for the non-equilibrium viscosity of glass has to be a function of both the composition X and the temperature T, as well as the thermal history, for example, as represented by the fictive temperature here, TF. And there are two different parts to this model. One is the isostructural contribution. So you see this is the Arrhenius dependence of the viscosity on temperature when the fictive temperature doesn't change. Um, so this part depends only on T and not on TF. And then the second part is the thermal history dependence, where this part depends only on TF, and not on T. So this part of the equation um, describes how the viscosity is changing as the fictive temperature changes. And this model, this is the, the so-called MAP model, has been validated for a wide variety of glasses. You can see here, this is the log viscosity versus time. So this is how the viscosity is evolving over time as this glass is held at either 600 degrees C 
or held isothermally at 650 degrees C or 675 degrees C. And over time, the viscosity is increasing. And it's increasing by a couple of orders of magnitude. And there's good agreement here between the experiment and the model. Same thing here for this other glass composition, uh, really faithful representation of how the viscosity increases over time. Um, you can see it's increasing over time because as the glass is relaxing, it is approaching the liquid state. So the viscosity has to increase as it um, departs from the glassy state and approaches the liquid state. Uh, moving on, let me get to the time dependence of the relaxation curves. And this is also described by an empirical equation that's very old, even older than the Volkov-Volter-Tamann equation. This is the Kohlrausch function. Uh, also called stretched exponential relaxation. And this was originally proposed by Kohlrausch back in 1847. And what he found was that uh, relaxation behavior um, didn't necessarily follow a simple exponential decay as shown in the blue curve. But if you take that simple exponential decay and raise the argument of the exponential to some power beta, it's as if you are taking the simple exponential decay here in blue and stretching it out. So you've got faster relaxation at short times, slower relaxation at long times, and this stretched exponential function can quite accurately capture um, relaxation kinetics over the full range of times. And there's only two free parameters, the relaxation time tau and this stretching exponent beta, which is a dimensionless quantity between zero and one. If beta equals one, then you recover simple exponential decay. So this was known as just a, a simple empirical equation for about 150 years. Um, Jim Phillips, shown here, um, actually was able to derive the, the physical meaning of the equation and show that it actually is a physically realistic um, functional form. And the stretching exponent beta does have physical meaning related to the dimensionality of the relaxation pathways. And he predicted two critical values of those stretching exponents as equal to either three-fifths or three-sevenths, depending upon um, the, system, the nature of the system and the type of property being measured. Um, this was actually fairly controversial when it was published, so we decided to test it out experimentally. And this shows um, the stress relaxation curves for Eagle XG class. Um, this, this is done by uh, a beam bending setup where um, a constant uh, deflection of the beam is maintained. These are three different constant deflections of a beam uh, as the glass is held isothermally at a given temperature. And initially, um, the stress that's required to maintain that, that deflection or that strain, um, that the, uh, the strain would be uh, completely elastic, meaning that it would be recovered completely when the stress is removed. Over time, that elastic strain converts into a plastic strain. And in the limit of long time, uh, the beam is permanently deformed. So meaning that there's no stress required to maintain that deflection anymore because it's permanent. And this decay of the stress that is required over time to, main, to maintain that constant strain is um, a measure of the stress relaxation. And we can convert this to a proper stress relaxation function by normalizing the initial value to one. So taking each of these three curves, normalizing them by their initial values, they um, all collapse onto a master curve that starts at one and decays to zero. And that master curve actually very accurately is described by a stretched exponential relaxation function using the Phillips um, exponent of three fifths. Uh, if we do the same thing on a different glass composition, we get the same type of result, but this is showing three different temperatures. All three of them are, can be fit with the same stretched exponential relaxation curve uh, with the same exponent of three fifths, and just varying the relaxation time tau uh, because the relaxation time is increasing exponentially as the temperature is lowered. However, if we take that same glass and the same set of temperatures 
And instead of measuring the stress relaxation, uh, we measure the density relaxation, which is a measure of structural relaxation. What we see is that the characteristic exponent actually changes, and it's a beta equals three sevenths, which is the other value predicted by three fifths. So what we found is that we got um, beta equals three fifths for stress relaxation. Um, and beta equals three sevenths for structural relaxation, which corresponds to the, the different dimensionality of the relaxation pathways as predicted by Phillips. So the same glass at the same temperatures, um, you know, the relaxation times can, can vary by over an order of magnitude just based on the type of relaxation that's being measured. Uh, in this case, structural relaxation being about one to two orders of magnitude slower compared to stress relaxation. Now, um, this was really interesting because we discovered by accident that Gorilla Glass, the glass that's on the cover of your phone, um, actually does relax at room temperature. This was discovered um, accidentally by a technician at Corning. At first, nobody believed him, and then he reproduced it. And then we went to a much larger scale setup to get really precise measurements and in fact, it is shrinking uh, at room temperature. And this is a glass that has a glass transition temperature of about 630 degrees Celsius. And so we, we made a one meter by one meter sheets of the glass um, and held them under constant uh, room temperature uh, conditions over a period of one and a half years and measured the shrinkage of these large sheets of glass. And over time, it over the period of one and a half years at room temperature, it shrunk by about um, 10 microns in each direction, about uh, 10 ppm in each direction. And this was reproducible. So there were two different sheets and both of them exhibited the same behavior. It's not simple exponential decay. Simple exponential decay would be what's shown in the red curve. It is in fact stretched exponential decay, fitted beautifully with um, Phillips's uh, magic exponent here of three sevenths. Um, and what was really interesting is that the room temperature viscosity of Gorilla Glass is about 10 to the 22 and a quarter Pascal seconds. So this is much too high um, to actually explain why this glass is shrinking. And um, what this is, is an example of what's called secondary relaxation or beta relaxation. It's a non-viscous relaxation mode. Um, so it's, it's enabling the glass to shrink um, using atomic motions that are much faster than the atomic motions that govern viscosity. Now, this was rather shocking because, you know, we had all been well versed in the work of Zenodo and Gupta that glasses were not flowing at um, room temperature. And yet we showed that one of our um, latest industrial glasses was in fact shrinking at room temperature. So we actually wanted to revisit the cathedral glass problem using our new knowledge and our new models and you know, new equipment that we had for measuring these. So um, rather than stealing a piece of glass from Westminster Abbey, we got the composition from a friend at the Corning Museum of Glass and we melted our own Westminster Abbey glass. So we used an actual medieval glass composition, which had not been done before. We uh, used the latest in all of our models to predict uh, the model prediction for the viscosity um, versus temperature. And then after making the model prediction, did the measurement here, which was one of the highest viscosities ever measured in the lab. It took several weeks just to get that measurement. And then use that to extrapolate what the viscosity would be at room temperature. And in fact, we found that it was about 10 to the 24.6 Pascal seconds at room temperature, or about 16 orders of magnitude lower viscosity than Gupta and Zenodo's work, which was in turn about nine orders of magnitude lower than Zenodo's original work. So we were predicting that actual medieval glass was flowing at about 25 orders of magnitude faster than what Zenodo had originally predicted. Is it fast enough to actually observe flow? Um, we actually did some fluid flow modeling as well um, to predict how much would actually flow. And this viscosity, while it's so much lower than had, what had been predicted before, is still extremely high. 
And what we found is that it would flow by only about one nanometer in a billion years. So even though our value is much lower than what had been published before, um, don't worry, the cathedral glass is still not flowing. So with that, I'll, I'll end and I'm happy to take any questions. If you wanna know more, I've got two textbooks out. This is our textbook, um, Glass Science. Um, so if you wanna know more about glass, uh, this is the place to go. And uh, I also have this uh, textbook on kinetics, which is suitable for um, either senior level undergrad or uh, first year graduate textbook on kinetics. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing and I'll be happy to take any questions. Well, I, I'm ask. gonna start with a question, John. Thank you for mm -hmm. this very, very interesting talk. Um, I would like to know what, in, for for in, we're, we have a lot of students and many more will listen to the talk when I post it. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I'd like to know what what it feels like to be uh, a, an inventor that has had so much impact on humanity because you basically invented Gorilla Glass. Yes, with colleagues, I know that, but you were there and you were one of the primaries. So um, what what is you know what what is that? sort of motivate in you? Um, it's really cool. Um, so I can, you know, remember seeing things going from just having like the chemical formula and a spreadsheet on my screen to, you know, doing some of the preliminary crucible melts to doing some of the development trials. And then finally, um, getting able to, get, to go to the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas for the grand release of the product and, and meet with the press and, and stuff like that. And as it happened, it, it was really kind of a whirlwind, um, but it really sank in one time afterwards when I was, I was on a flight and, um, and we landed, this is a, a Trans-Pacific flight and we landed. And what did every single person do when the plane landed? They all pulled out their smartphones and started touching a piece of glass that you know, most likely was, was something that, that I had made or, or together with my colleagues. And it just, it, it really dawned on me at that point in time, you know, how ubiquitous it had become. And what I found you know, the most satisfying about it is that it, um, it helped to change the, the general public's perception of glass because prior to that, I think most people in the public had just thought of glass as being some old fashioned material that breaks easily. And you know, we had developed a, a new glass that was extremely thin, very strong, um, very resistant to, to scratches and indentation and, and drop damage. And that new material had become the primary means through which people interact with these devices. It's, it's through touching uh, the glass itself. So it, it was a lot of, a lot of fun. Um, and I really, um, I really enjoyed it. Uh, it gets to be, um, you know, it, it, it's exhilarating each, each time that it, it happens. Um, and as you said, it's, it's a team effort because it's, um, you know, we're no longer in the age where, you know, one person can invent something and, you know, take it all the way to commercialization. It's really a team on the research side for development, for engineering, for legal issues, for commercial things. Um, it's, you know, running it in the plant as well. Um, it, it takes, you know, hundreds of people to be able to, to do it and, and to do that effectively. Well, congratulations, really. You, you have had a gigantic impact. It's unbelievable. <laughs>